Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ahead of the Curve. I am your host, Jeffrey Platt. And on the show today, I have my guest, Mark Coxon. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I hear things are a little crazy in California these days. Lots of fires going on. Uh, yeah, I think I saw I think I saw a post comparing our skies to Blade Runner 2049 right now, which was uh, <laughs> probably the most relevant uh, post I saw side by side. So, um, you know, no Ryan Gosling, unfortunately for us, but red skies. Yeah, it's kind of crazy just to just to see all of the posts and everything that's happening over on the West Coast right now is kind of scary in a lot of ways especially during this time, yeah. you know, having those wildfires affecting so many people during a pandemic, it's like a, another double whammy. Yeah, it's a, it's a very strange, it's a very strange environment. I happen to sit in a pocket, thank, thank God, but I happen to sit in a pocket that's somewhat between um, everything that's going on. And so uh, we're, we're safely situated for now, but yeah, it's, it's pretty scary to see, see half the, uh, half the sky red every morning. So yeah. I think we can just tack that another one up to 2020. There you go. <laughs> we'll put it up there with killer, mass killer, crazy hornets. There you go. Exactly. Or shark, sharknado. I'm waiting for the sharknado. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. So, Mark, can you give us a little kind of idea of where you where you come from, where you where you got started, and uh, what you're doing now? Yeah, so I mean, I'm a. It's it's funny. I, I work in technology, obviously, and uh, I was one of these kids that never thought he would work in technology. I didn't take my radio apart as a kid. I didn't build, uh, <laughs> you know, robots or any of these type of things. You know, I grew up thinking That's it, that, you're uh, off the show. We're done with you. <laughs> we're done. See you. Um, so. You know, I wasn't a tinkerer, or a maker, or any of these things as a kid, which you know, I which is funny. I always thought that I wanted to be a veterinarian and I wanted to work in a zoo, and so I was always interested in being outside and you know chasing animals around and photography and all sorts of things like that on that end. Um, but you know, as life goes, uh, at some point, I ended up working for IBM, and that was kind of my start into technology. And mm. I had to learn everything from the ground up because I didn't know anything about uh, the technology that I was required to talk about. I mean, they put me on the phone calling 65 IT managers a day and having to ask them about their computers. And I had knew nothing about computers, right? So, um, and this was in pre-Google, this was 2000. So Google wasn't around. We were having to use some of these older, you know, web browsers and things. Information wasn't readily available. It was hard to learn things. And so um, I just, I'm lucky that I'm innately curious. And that started my career in technology. I, I learned a lot um, in a couple of years at IBM, moved into residential audio video, uh, where I got to deal with a ton of people in Arizona during the housing boom from 2002 to 2007. Um, so and then ended up kind of really high end uh, or higher end home installations, home AV, or it was a you know it was a mix. So we did um, we did a lot of work with Dr. Horton, Shea Homes, and Toll Brothers. So sometimes the homes were you know ten thousand square foot one story in North Scottsdale where there was a huge you know custom audio video system, and sometimes it was just structured wiring and a and a security system. So it kind of ranged uh, a lot. And, uh, but I think the biggest plus I had from that era um, in retrospect was I met about 2,000 new people a year in that job through the busiest couple years. Wow. And sitting down across from 2,000 unique individuals talking about something that was very emotional to them, which was home, which is a reflection of them and an extension of them in a way, um, really gave me an insight into how people relate to their space and to technology in general across this huge bandwidth of um, ages and and you know nationalities etc that were moving in and so um, i took that in 2009 i moved to california and i got into the commercial side of audio video where i am now um, i i did work for a company that did a lot of museum work which was really fun and experiential 
Um, and then uh, I work now for an interiors company that does high-end office interiors, but I'm the director for a technology team. So kind of a little bit of a winding road, but the technology part of it started, uh, I sheepishly say, almost 20 years ago now. So <laughs> It's amazing how fast time goes by. It's crazy. <laughs> so I just wanted to say hi to the viewers. Hey, everybody. Hey, Brett. And Social Security, of course, kind of helping us out with some of the marketing. Scott, definitely spinning things around a little bit differently, adding some uh, diversity, I think, to the to the uh, information that we're sharing over the course of this time. So, you know, it's an interesting time, I think, for everyone uh, as we kind of work our way through this pandemic and this time in our lives. You know, it's been it's been one crazy ride, I think, for many, many people. And it's fun to see what people's stories are and see how people are, are being affected and see how people are working their ways through this as well this, this time, which is really interesting. I think one of the biggest questions on a lot of people's minds, of course, is what what is life gonna be like on the other side of this whole thing? And um, myself, you know, my I, I've shared my opinions on this question quite a bit over the course of the last, or over the last several months. But I, I feel that, you know, life is already converting and changing. And I think we're starting to see results and, and companies formulate ideas of how life is going, how life is changing, how uh, our spaces are being affected publicly, uh, especially. And one of the things I really wanted to talk to you as well, Mark, about today is about those effects on the spaces and you know our human connections to these public spaces as we get into them and how that affects us as as humans but how you know it could be navigated in a safe way and then how technology can enhance and help us navigate those spaces as we go through so i'd love to kind of hear some of your opinions on on that topic and kind of just start to dig right into you know how we're affected and some of your experiences in working in these public spaces and implementing those technologies to help us kind of navigate our, our our way around. Yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's very interesting because um, you know a lot of people are talking about a COVID pivot or the pandemic pivot, right? We hear this word <laughs> pivot or the or the new normal. We, you know, we hear these terms, and when I really look at um, when I look at public space and I look at technology and I look at people, um, when I'm looking at the things that are starting to emerge they're really not a pivot. Um, they're an extension or an acceleration of things that we've had in the works for quite a long time, right? So if you think mm -hmm. about even in the workplace itself, um, this whole, you know, everybody working from home and the advent of teleconferencing and more webinars and all these things, all these technologies and all of these, all of these devices have been there for years. They've just never hit a tipping point where they were accelerated past people's, I guess, um, desire to change, right? So we have to remember that we're dealing with humans in all of these spaces and humans have multiple motivations all at work at any given time. So, <laughs> you know, the workplace didn't transform not because technology wasn't there or that the efficiencies weren't there or that, um, or that there weren't these advantages prior to the pandemic. Things started to change because people were required to adopt them. They had no choice. Somebody mm -hmm. flipped a switch and said, if you want to continue living life and not be a hermit stuck in a bubble in your house and potentially lose your job, you're going to learn how to use technology to as an extension of your life and your normal activities. So we know that, you know, Zoom, you know, went up like 20x, you know, in a month. Oh, yeah. We know that Am Amazon subscriptions and Prime went through the roof. People that would never order things online or ordering things online. You know, Target put out, you know, 50 new parking spots in every single one of their, their pieces for the drive up delivery service, which existed for the pandemic, but nobody was using. Um, so, really, I mean, look at I webcams, mean, I think for example, webcams as well, trying to find a camera, camera systems, they've gone they're exorbitant right now. It's they're a commodity. Yeah. Hot commodity. Yeah. They're they're a super hot commodity. So all of a sudden these things that were that were here and in our in our environment in a very small way have now become extremely important. So it wasn't so much again, I don't think it's been so much as a pivot as a shift. And I think when we look at um, 
when we look at our public spaces, when we look at any space that we interact as a community, and I'm even gonna take the new office as a public space because I don't think that the new office will be so much for task-based work. I think we will still have that. Let me say this, I, my biggest point, if, if anybody takes anything away from me talking today, humans are creatures of habit. If anybody thinks that all of a sudden we're all just gonna sit at our desk from now on into eternity and we're all gonna be home-based workers, they're wrong, right? The people that are saying that have a vested interest in them saying that. Just like the people who have a vested interest in saying that the office will just return to normal in three months, everybody will forget about it and we'll just go back to what we were doing before. That's probably not realistic either, right? There's going to be some mix, but as humans, we are creatures of habit and there are certain things that we need. And I loved um, Gensler put out a couple years ago, something called the experience index. And I don't know if any of your people have talked about that, but the experience index, if, if none of you have seen it, you should look it up. It's a free piece of, of literature you can get from Gensler. And it's actually really cool visually as an infographic on their website as well. But the experience index talks about the different motivations of people, the different modes that they're in when they visit public space. If people were only shopping, they wouldn't go to the mall. They just wouldn't typically because, because they can, in fact, get what they want online for a price that's probably cheaper than the retail without having to expend gas, energy, time. The reason that people go to a place like that is because they're actually engaging in several activities at once. They're yeah. in discovery mode. They're looking for happenstance, for opportunities. Here's something I didn't know I wanted that now I saw and now I want, right? Whereas a, an environment like that provides that, okay? The, um, the, uh, they're in entertainment mode. Some people like to people watch. Some people like to, they're in social mode. They want to interact with other human beings. So there are all these motivations in play when somebody goes to a public space. And so if we want to think about how technology is going to play a larger role in the future, we really have to understand why people are going places, right? What are those intrinsic motivations and how do we make those spaces fulfill those in a very unique way that you can't get somewhere else? And this is the whole idea that you'll hear people talk about, about placemaking. Like I love following companies like the Moment Factory. I don't know if you've had any of them on your show. They're oh, from- they're I from haven't that. had them on my show, but I've definitely had them watching the show and I've had a lot of engagement with them over the course of the last few months. Oh my goodness, like what a great, what a great company, right? Turning public parks and spaces into these destinations where events happen and kids can come in and they get a magic wand and they go through a trail and as they point it at trees, you know, lights shoot up in the air and mm -hmm. the magic forest comes alive and they get this education and this experience. You can't do that online, right? The, the, um, the impact, the scale of that, there's something very visceral about engaging peripheral vision, about engaging emotion, about your heart beating as you can't see around a corner, about these foreshadowings. And I think if we think about space in that way, we have to think about space in the way that we um, experience the world. And then how do we use technology to start to build that story and increase, in, I guess, uh, intensify those innate emotions that we're trying to fulfill. So for me, like. I think there's a huge, huge opportunity to innovate things. I talk about all the time, let's talk about conferences. So we've all been doing virtual conferences, right? We've been doing these virtual oh trade shows. Time and time again, month and month and month and month again. Right, yeah, like I could I could hit myself in, a, in, in the head with a hammer instead of go to another webinar, I swear. Like <laughs> I, I just am done, right? Like. I don't want to see somebody's PowerPoint in their three inch in their three inch face in a Zoom window underneath. You know, unless it's something very very valuable to me, I'm not going to just tune into that. In the in the beginning, I did. Now I'm I'm about done. Um, yeah, but it's even the same, but even it's been kind of in the same the same situation. I think for just about everybody here, you know, the guys from on events are watching the show, and I'm sure that they've been coming up with some really interesting ways to deliver content, you know, in a really engaging manner. And I think that's one of the things that everybody's really trying to trying to figure out as well right now. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think we have this huge opportunity to break these legacy spaces that are just boring and broken. You know, I talk about, <laughs> think about a hotel ballroom. So you go to a conference and you do a breakout session and they put you in a room that's a divisible room. It's got a 12 foot ceiling. It's got a chandelier. It's got pink acoustic panels on the walls and a sliding divider and you sit in a 
in a metal banquet chair, shoulder to shoulder with 50 other people in metal banquet chairs, writing in a tablet on your lap. Is that sounds an like, environment? Sounds like, home, sounds like home to me, Mark. <laughs> but is that an environment that's conducive to learning, experiencing, and absorbing? Right. I say, you know, the problem with that room is it was made, it was designed to serve reheated food. That's what that room was decide, designed to do. It was designed to have an eight foot table with sterno and some chicken piccata and to go sit at a round table. Right. That room was not in, that room was not designed to create excitement, to create the opportunity for people to be in different modes of learning. Right, like some people like to stand when they learn. Some people like to sit. Some people like to lounge. Lounging helps you think more critically. Sitting up in a perch position helps you be more creative. Depending on the purpose of that space, you need to be able to shift and design that space in a way that supports all these different modes of learning and experiencing things, as well as creates the most engagement. Right, and being under this chandelier light with a twenty, you know, with a washed out projection screen in the front that the 2000 lumen projector that the bulb hasn't been changed in four months comes out from the <laughs> AV contractor of choice. That is not a place where you're going to leave excited about what's going on. And you can make those spaces immersive, but why are we designing? Why are we designing spaces that we know are used for that purpose? in a way that no longer suits that purpose, right? And so for me, I think there are all these huge opportunities for innovation in how we design these spaces to be more flexible, but also to provide uh, more of a sensory rich experience for the users and also leverage um, what uh, Kay Sargent at HOK, I don't know if you follow her on LinkedIn, she's amazing, but she's always talking about neurodiversity you know, the neurodiversity of individuals that people are all learn and experience the world differently. And we need to create environments that cater to multiple modes of, of uh, experience as opposed to one. And these spaces are made for one person, you know, and we'll get 30% of them that get something out of it. And the other 70 will leave and, and not experience what was meant to be there. So anyways, I, I would love, um, I'd love to see some innovation in public space in that way. And I think we really have to think about outcomes and we have to think about people and we have to ditch think, the spec sheet. I was going to say, I think that there are some companies that have been pretty progressive there. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had the uh, opportunity to uh, explore or, or see the Amazon offices in Seattle, for example, where they've created some very beautiful different spaces within their office building where the employees can kind of go and sit in different environments. You know, they have an in indoor garden area, for example, that kind of goes through in these different leveled uh, tiered sections within the building where you can, you can go into basically different environments to be able to learn different things and engage with your colleagues and just talk over different, different experiences and different things. But I think you're right. And I think there's a lot to be said about that, especially inside of conference spaces and inside of areas where you are expected to absorb, you know, mass amounts of information, say in a short period of time. You know, it's all that was one of my biggest challenges when I was a, working as a production designer to try and build these huge sets or these these great big kind of more immersive ways of being able to not only educate but entertain people inside of those spaces. And there's a lot of effort and a lot of time that's put into to doing that. Um, but starting to, you know, trying to see that on a more public based level, even inside the retail spaces, as you mentioned, I think is a, an interesting challenge. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we've, we've come from a place where, you know, life was much more transactional, you know, where, where, you know, there was a, a product and you went to the store and that was the only place you could get information on the product. You trusted the person that was standing there to tell you about the product and you needed to know. You bought the product, you left, you used the product and hopefully it was good. In today's world, we really don't work that way. In today's world, we start thinking about a product, we start doing research, we start thinking about the different ways that we could use it, we read reviews, we get an idea if anybody else we know through crowdsourcing, through social media has used the product. By the time we go to a place, we are looking to experience the product to confirm or deny anything that we learned in our virtual exploration, 
right? So these places, you know, that's why the Apple store has always been so great is because really they have five things in there. They have a MacBook, they have an iPad, they have an iPad mini, they have an iPhone, and then maybe they have, you know, they don't have, but they, but they have 20 of each of them. They're out on the tables for people to touch, feel, play with, and they load the things that are fun to use. They load games, they load the, the art apps, they run classes on how to edit photos and how to draw and all of those things. So what they do is they create this experience of come in and use the product. You're not required to buy anything while you're here. You're not even required mm -hmm. to talk to a salesperson if you don't want to. We know you can do research on the phones and the specs and the, you know, we have people here to tell you that if you need it. But the blanket assumption is, is that you're there to experience something. And it's why, you know, even though the Apple store is a rectangle and they, they have some great screens and they're starting to do LED now instead of just the Re backlit, rectangle up um, until tomorrow. Uh -huh. They're opening, they've got their new floating uh, store in Singapore that opens tomorrow. That's in the shape oh, of a great sphere. Wow. That's so, so cool. So, you know, everything in that store is designed for experience though. And I don't know if you've ever looked up, but even the way that they do the lighting and the ceiling, they want it to be um, completely even corner to corner, edge to edge across the store. And and I remember um, working, and I think it's really long enough now, I, I wasn't specifically under NDA, but I remember working a long time ago and seeing just different tiles that they had with um, different lenticular patterns on them that they were putting over the lights to try to make sure that the lights were dispersed evenly throughout the space, even though that, you know, there's not constant lighting left to right. So if you have these spots of lights, in different locations, how do you make that create a completely even coverage and yep. create the same intensity? And so even that is thought out in the Apple store. How can we make sure there aren't bright spots on tables that highlight one thing over the other or make somebody feel like they're in a different spot than, than someone else? So I just think we, we're gonna see more and more of that thought process brought in. I haven't been to Amazon, but I have been, um, I've been to the Facebook campus. They have some of the very similar things. They have bicycles to go between the campuses. They're across from a park where you could take a half hour bike ride um, through kind of like the back bay area there. I mean, places that are starting to create these different environments for breaks, for shifts in mindset, um, those are things I think we're gonna start to see more in public space and technology will play a huge role in that. And I'm really, yeah, I'm personally really interested to see how that's going to change and how that's going to um, evolve, I, I guess is the proper word over the course of the next year or two. What are your thoughts about the changes and the evolutions kind of of how we're going to be experiencing public spaces? I mean, even now you go to a shopping mall and the place is completely empty for the most part. You walk into the doors of the theme parks and the theme parks are having a hard time even hitting minimum capacity, you know, with the with things opening up right now. I think that part of that is just simply due to um, people not people not having an understanding of what the next steps are. or We don't have any basically plan for a lack of a better term, a plan in place. Um, not, there's no writing on the wall as to when life might go back to being normal. But, you know there is evidence, definite evidence that things are, are changing and people are gonna be more cautious the way that we interact with each other, the way that we travel, uh, the way that we work and engage in spaces. So what are your thoughts on the way that we're engaging with the space now? And maybe what are your thoughts on being able to improve that? That's kind of, a, it's a little bit of a double, double. <laughs> it might not be a fair question, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. <laughs> A double question. Well, I mean, we can't we can't account for we can't account for um, you know the psychology of safety, right? Like, when are when is everybody going to feel safe enough to go? And that's going to be different for everyone. And there's going to be some point at which we reach a majority of people that feel decently safe around lots of other people and touching things that they touched, right? Some people do now; they're fine with it. Um, some people are still, you know, very, very skeptical about doing anything outside that part of human psychology. I don't, I don't know that we can predict, you know, when that ends. I mean, if anybody says that's six months from now, I don't know where they're getting data from to say when, when exactly that ends. Um, but as far as, as far as, um, you know, just the difference in the way that people, uh, participate in space, 
many times we will trade um, many times we will trade privacy for convenience, and I think we will also trade privacy for safety or for perceived mm -hmm. safety. And so what I think we're going to start to see in some of these spaces, um, we're going to start to see, and, and touchless is a big buzzword right now. I, I don't think touch is going away. I still think the most discreet way to trigger something in a room is to touch in order to touch a, an icon on a screen. Well, we're, all, we're um, also physical beings. So not having that physical engagement, I think adds that layer of detachment. It, it does. So, you know, we're kinetic. So, I think I think in some level, if if we if we do see reduction in touch, it's going to be reduction in community touch devices and just pushed into our personal devices, right? So that as you enter a space, um, NFC or Bluetooth or some type of beacon will allow the controls for the space to be available in your personal device, so that you're not having to touch something as somebody else interacted with. You can use your own device and be comfortable with that. And there are there are systems out there that do that. And that's my point isn't to promote one or the other. It's just to say that it's there. Um, I think the <laughs> other thing, you know, there's a whole. I get a newsletter that talks about um, the resistance of live events to use facial recognition, and there's a big privacy push behind not using facial recognition in public spaces or for public events. Yeah. I completely get that. I, I get that. I understand privacy and I'm I'm not a I'm not against protecting people's privacy. But let me tell you, I'll say the but. <laughs> I'll say and and I'll say and instead of but let's say the power of and there's too and, many buts. And I also understand that there are ways that you can protect the individual privacy of people while still using those technologies. Let me say, so you can use a facial recognition system that never stores the picture of someone's face, but only uses their facial geometry, the distance between their nostrils, their eyes, their ears, the corners of their mouth, which is very unique to a person, right? Mm -hmm. You can use that facial geometry and use that same facial geometry to trigger experiences for people as they walk through a space and not store that information ever past the day that they're there. So they yeah. leave the park, the facility, that information is gone. Even the geometry, the triangles and the, and the squares that you're using to track someone's face are gone. And it isn't possible to recreate someone's face just from the geometry. There's too many other things that are happening in your face that you can't just take face geometry and then go, oh, this is Bob Smith, because we found these triangles and these squares, and Bob <laughs> Smith is the only person who has these triangles and squares, right? So, so there are ways that we can do this. There are ways that we can do this. And the other, you know, I'm, I used to work for a company called Mad Systems. And again, I'm not promoting anybody, but Mad Systems has been playing with facial recognition. They have their own version of facial recognition that they're using for museums. Yeah. And one other th way that they're doing it is instead of facial recognition, they can actually use object and color recognition. So what happens if kids come into a museum from a school? They're usually all wearing the same t-shirt or a hat or something that identifies them as part of this group so that if an instructor or a teacher looks around, they can quickly identify who's in their group and who isn't. So why not take the logo on the t-shirt, the logo on the hat, the color of the hat, code that to a group. And now as that group walks through, they know they speak Spanish. They're from eight years old to 12 years old. And you cater the content, the subtitles, and the language maybe playing through the audio based on the hat that's standing there. And you're not tracking recognition at all. So you don't have a privacy issue unless somebody else comes in with the red hat with the school logo, they might hear Spanish, but you'll never know that, you know, Tim's kid was in the museum four days ago, right? So we have these opportunities to use technologies. And I think we get so much, we get in our heads about the risks that we, that sometimes we don't under, we don't um, fully consider how we can extract the advantage of the technology while mitigating the risk and making it something that somebody's comfortable using. And I think we're gonna see these type of technologies really become something that people are, are okay with in a park if they understand behind it. I mean, we all click, click I agree to get an app. <laughs> Pretty and much, we're, yeah. And then we're like, oh, they're spying on me because I got an ad for popsicles on Instagram. And you're like, no, when you said I agree, you said my history is going here and we share it with our partners and it may be used to target you for ads and services. That's why you got popsicles. Nobody's spying on you. You said yes. You said yes. Was it, you got to share this information. Should they be, 
should they be um, more upfront about what you're saying yes to, or should, I don't know, that's an argument for sure, right? I mean, it's there, you can read it. And if you don't wanna click yes, you don't. But we trade, again, we trade convenience for privacy all the time. I think we can do these things in public spaces in a way that still protects the individual privacy of a specific person, but allows um, technology to adapt the space to the person at hand, so. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up the the whole privacy issue because just a fun little sub story, you know, that um, got a friend of mine that was in a space with a great big huge beach ball, and it was this huge huge beach ball, and it was there for the weekend, and he never mentioned anything about a beach ball, yet a few days later, Facebook ads started to target him and started to pop up great big beach ball advertisements <laughs> for things to buy. And he's like, how the hell did they get that information? I didn't say anything about the beach ball. Beach ball was there, but I didn't say anything about the beach ball. Yeah, so, we've we've noticed, um, you know, my 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 theory, my for for what it's worth, and you know, people will debate this all day long. Um, my my theory <laughs> is that um, <laughs> is that Siri Siri and Google with their with their voice activation have microphone access and typically are just feeding that information to Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, through the, through the end user license agreement. That's all I can figure out because I know we'll have conversations about things in my house that we don't search for and they show up. So I know it's not based on search history. It is based on some auditory information. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's why Facebook can confidently say, we don't have access to your microphone. Um, no, it's Google that does. They just, they just give us the data. <laughs> that does <laughs> so they can they can go to zuckerberg can stand confidently in congress and say we never listen to anything you say um but google does and they send it to us and we use it <laughs> <laughs> i guess that also brings us you know brings me to the point of privacy and our privacy as a whole um it's hard to avoid any anything where technology is interconnected and you know, for me personally, I have no problems. I'm like, if you wanna pick me up in a space and you wanna pick up my demographics of how old I am and me being a white male and me having short hair and me wearing the shirt, and whatever, I'm like, I'm cool with that. You know, I just don't want that that uh, information used for any malicious purpose. But uh, some in some cases, you know, with me being a technologist as well, I look at it as also a, a benefit in a lot of ways, being able to have things being catered to you so you don't have to worry about things or having ideas, you know, like, for me, again, I like to use technology and see things populate in my feeds that I am interested in, as opposed to a whole bunch of junk just populating where I'm weeding through the crap as I'm going through it, you know? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, I think, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages, but there's also the rights of privacy, which is uh, really interesting. And I know that Europe has really tight restrictions on what you can and cannot use for data especially inside of public spaces. I've worked uh, with a number of companies over there, especially on the digital signage side of the industry where they want to use it for artistic purposes, you know, in a retail board. Uh, they may, might want to be able to pick you up as you're walking by just to grab your attention and maybe grab the silhouette of you so that they can um, use, you know, different pieces of advertising for their product, but to kind of engage with you. And mm -hmm. it's a really touchy subject. Uh, when it comes down to it, you know, Christy has actually been <laughs> Christy's been asking a couple of questions along the ways and comments. But you know, risks versus benefits, absolutely. Um, you know, we're being targeted by all, all the time through our devices, absolutely. Uh, how do we restri restrict that? Best way: not use a phone, not have Siri, not have Google anywhere around you, um, and you're still at the mercy of those who do within those public yeah. spaces. You know, I mean, um, I mean it. I think you see, you know, in pop culture, I think we start start to see the the extrapolation of some of this in a lot of ways. And sometimes, you know, maybe it's taking it to an extreme that will never that will never reach in a dystopian future, right? But but there are always great things to think about. I mean, there's um if you if you watched the movie The Circle, um, I don't know if you ever watched the movie The Circle with Tom Hanks. I haven't watched it. No, I and I uh, Emma Watson, I think is is the main character in The Circle. Um. Great movie about social media, about um, being tracked, about um, all of those things that happen um, in a space. Uh, that one's interesting. There's uh, 
and just are you are you entitled to privacy right like there's a big question of that in the circle and and how that can go wrong um, people trying to get off the grid there's another movie called anon with clive owen which is a little risque if you don't there's some nudity and prostitution and some things in it but if you want to see what, kind the of, name like, of that movie again mark i think it's anon <laughs> a-n a-n <laughs> so but uh, it's a uh, clive owen and amanda siegfried and it's um you know it's this it's a culture where everybody has a contact everybody has a heads up display and all of everything that you see from your viewpoint is logged so if they want to see if somebody was walking down the street they can all of a sudden search that face and it'll go through everybody's everybody's database of what they saw that day and oh well this person saw them here at 12 15 and this person saw them here at one o'clock and this person saw them here at two so they were walking east down the street at this time going from this place to this place um and in that movie actually you know people going off the grid and and uh not having access to their cameras which was which was an interesting piece as well right like that um why should you see what i'm doing all the time so i think there are, i think we have these you know the kind of these extrapolations of what that is and i think we have to be conscious of it um but some i think there are some advantages you know to to using technology to do some of those things and i i think we'll strike a balance and there christy says social dilemma documentary that touches on this i'll have to look at that i also have a friend named josh Sarago who's just uh finished up he's finishing up law school um and is coming out as a you know his his main intent he was a technology guy to come out um and uh address technology privacy uh issues from a legal standpoint which i don't think in technology probably in the facebook's and the amazons they have those people but in the av folks that i know um you know integrators doing audio video systems for a museum or for uh, a corporate space. You know, I don't think we have the legal expertise to know if we put a camera in, if we're liable as a company for that surveillance or if it's the customer who's liable if something goes wrong and they don't alert their people that they're being filmed. So um, I, I think we all have we all have our part to play in that for no, sure. No, absolutely. I, I think that's a topic as well that we could, it's an interesting topic and it's interesting that we kind of veered along that path in the conversation because I, it's a really important part of it and it's important for both the technology and important for the people uh, that are engaging with it. I mean, a lot of these pop-ups and experiential um, pop-ups that have been coming up have been reliant on sensors to be able to pick up different actions that you're doing to be able to engage with the content, you know. Uh, same thing even to the point now where we're getting into VR being able to capture data from a VR headset as to your point of view, what you're looking at inside of the application, inside the program, your gestures, how you react with the controllers, you know, all that data um, is, is readily available to those uh, good old disclosures that you check off when you set up the software and plop that headset and grab those sensors, you know? So, Wait. Well, you mentioned VR, so I'm going to go on my pet peeve on VR. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> so, so for me, I, I think I think VR extended. I think any of the XR extended realities, mixed reality, augmented, or virtual reality. I think they're all going to play a part. Say XR it kind of falls under all of it. Okay, the so the umbrella. The biggest, I think, right now, our biggest, our biggest challenge with XR and the problem everybody should be working on. Um, is the interface it's just the user interface um and i'll give you an example like i we were talking about me earlier so i'll i'll go back on the me subject i have done uh, muay thai kickboxing for 26 years right and i teach kickboxing i've caught, taught it the last seven years at a krav maga gym in orange county i've taught it off and on for 18 years um i i've i don't lose sparring matches in my gym Right, like I just have the experience. Nobody else in the gym has the experience of being punched in the face more than me, so I'm not afraid of it anymore. So I'm able to go do this. So I go to my brother-in-law's house, and he has HTC Vive. Right when it first came out, and great system, not a bad system. Has a computer, runs fast, um, great graphics, sensors on the ceiling to show where I'm at within the box as I move around a little bit. Um, but you still have joysticks, right? Yeah, still have controllers. Um, we don't navigate our world with a controller. So number one, if you really want to 
put somebody in the mindset that they're in a space, you have to let them interact with the space as they would if they were actually in the space. If I don't interact with my office desk with a joystick, then it is never going to feel the same for me to interface in a virtual environment with the joystick. But my point of this story about the kickboxing was this, is that there is a game called Bar Fight, and I cannot win one fight in Bar <laughs> Fight, and I know how to fight. So if virtual reality can't pick up, can't pick up my 26 years of skill and let me bring that into a game that is meant to be a virtual fighting game, then the interface is broken, right? Like <laughs> it just is. <laughs> the interface is busted. But in all serious, in all seriousness, no, it, it is. And, and people have been working on this for a while. Like, in a, like a virtual training for soldiers, they use dome projection and they'll give you this virtual environment. And um, they were actually starting to do things like a 360 treadmill where I can run forward and it's actually a pad that moves in omnidirectional. So if I start to move sideways, I may track two or three feet into the room before the floor starts moving sideways underneath me and now I stay. So you move a little bit within like a nine, 10 foot circle, but you could run unlimited to the right and never be out of that nine foot circle because the floor starts moving underneath you. And if I jumped and rolled forward, I would roll into the floor, the floor would be there. So then we start to talk about like, how do we use technology in a way that allows us to use our bodies as the interface? There are companies working through that. Gesture controls obviously out there and some other Absolutely. things, but but I, you know, I think that's, if we really wanna focus on making XR, VR, part of the, you know, part of the, um, I guess the real world feel, look and feel. If we want to, if we want to be able to leverage human emotion and feeling, we have to, we have to fix the interface on these things. The other thing that's interesting with that is like, if you think about a ride, so we talked about theme parks earlier. One mm -hmm. of the interesting things I I've, I've, I found out early on about rides, especially motion rides. So back to the future at Universal Studios, right? Um, that ride made people throw up all the time in the beginning, and it wasn't a it wasn't a matter of the actual G's being pulled because what happens in a ride, if people don't know, what happens in a ride is there's a six degrees of motion platform, and that platform yeah. can tilt back, can tilt forward, left, right. It's on this axis that can provide every tilt that you need to pull G forces. So it feels like you're going around a corner. It feels like you're, you're accelerating by tilting you back in your seat, right? That's what's there. And then you're also looking at a screen that's moving. And if your body feels force that's different than the frame, than the speed that the film is showing, you'll actually go into this vertigo where what you're seeing and what your body is feeling are not the same and your yeah, brain yeah. freaks out. Yeah. Your brain just freaks out. So you know, we to have to. Because I know the term for that, and I'm trying to remember that, trying to I, bring it up in my brain the hardest I can, but it's just not yeah. popping up right now. But yeah, I don't. I don't remember it either. Maybe, maybe it's a. This is the Google test. So everybody, you told, you were told <laughs> at one point in ahead of the curve there would be a Google test. First person to put the term in the comments uh, gets ten <laughs> ahead of the curve points. Point. For with a value to be determined later. Um, oh man, I'm gonna have to pull me up something for this show. This is a well. Fart. You could call me. You could call. You could call me. Um, I'll send something out. Somebody gets the term. I'll send something out. But uh, there, it, it's serious though. I mean that if you if it looks like you're going 55 miles an hour and your body feels like it's going 35 miles an hour, you will throw up. Yeah. So there's this yeah, dissociation your brain, your between brain. what you're part of our yeah. internal system to let you know that something's not right right here. Something mm -hmm. is not right now. Also yeah, triggers so, your fight, fight or flight, uh, your fight or flight um, sim or actions as well. Yeah, and on the fight or flight thing, I read something, we're talking about public spaces again. Um, I read this article and I hadn't heard this, I hadn't heard this theory before. And again, I should have wrote it down. So there's a theory, but I'll, I'll tell you the gist of the theory, although I don't remember the, the exact terminology again. Um, but uh, me being somebody who loves animal behavior, I loved, I loved seeing this out in a written space is that when we're talking about spaces, um, animals look for a place where they feel protected, but where they can also observe. So if you think about us being predator prey, we want to be in a place where we can survey the landscape 
in case we need to go get food, attack something, go take advantage of an opportunity. But we also want to be in a place that although we can see everything that we're shielded from attack from behind, above, below, right? That that what we can see, our threats are in, in the space that we're being able to observe and not in the spaces that we can't. And I've, I've seen this uh, diagram before of foveal vision of, you know, the six degree uh, vision that you're focusing on in front of your face. This is what you see and everything outside of that are the, that can kill you. So this is what you're looking at. <laughs> and these are all the things out here that you're not really paying attention to that can kill you. And this is why um, if you're thinking about creating immersive experiences, creating subtle effects in the peripheral vision actually keep people's brain more engaged in a state that they absorb more stuff. So if you really want, if you really wanted to do something cool in a space when we we're talking earlier about education, maybe you could take lights that had a gentle blue wave towards the center or you're always keeping the person's. Yeah. So you're always keeping the person's um, focus going to the middle, but you're always keeping the peripheral engaged in a way that it's not uh, distracting or alarming, mm -hmm. but it's keeping that part of the brain alive, knowing that something's happening out here in a safe way. And it, so I think we really, if we really want to turn the corner going forward with like spaces and making them very impactful and creating experiences that people have to go there to get that exact experience, we really almost have to go primal. We have to go backwards, right? Like I always say the first, when was wireless communication invented? I put this out in a, in a thing and I made the mistake of letting somebody answer. So I'm not going to put you on the spot to answer it. But, what, <laughs> but wireless communication was invented when T-Rex growled at a triceratops. I mean, that was wireless communication. It was analog, <laughs> moving air. So as technology <laughs> progresses, the funny thing about the way technology has worked is we've created tools to solve problems. So for um, the problem of distance, we created the telephone, right? For the problem of um, information over time, we created a book. And then when we had a computer, we want instant access, we have the internet. And then we created a keyboard in order to control the internet. So what we did is we created these tools that are things that aren't natural, keyboard, mouse, et cetera, in a way to, to solve these problems of time and distance and space. And now if we think about the future of technology, it's now how do we start to eliminate those tools in the middle as something that people have to learn for friction, still take a, a advantage of the distance, eliminating time, distance, and space, but not using the tools that are in the middle anymore. And that's why we're coming back to voice control. That's why we're coming back to things like eye tracking. That's why we're coming back to the things like gesture. We're coming back and we're saying, okay, we used all these tools because it was the only way to facilitate it. But now that technology has expanded, we can actually go back to the natural way humans interact with their environment, take the tools out of the middle and reduce friction. And then we get universal adoption. And that's really what we have to start to think about if we're talking about friction in a space. And so I'm always trying to think about, um, you know, the physics of the workspace, like the friction that people have. How do we eliminate friction to increase acceleration, right, of Absolutely. the technology? As Scott was saying, things we generally don't understand quickly, we funnel into a conspiracy theory. <laughs> that is that's true. true. I think it plays a lot on the fears, the fears of the unknown, of course, and the insecurities based on what that technology is, for example, and what it's capable of doing. It really just plays on people's fears um, of those of those different elements, because it it does cause people to kind of come together to try and work things out in a conspiracy sort of way. <laughs> Christy was yeah, mentioning. Which... Sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, I was going to say, which I think, I mean, as, as things go forward, I think, you know, which really, really highlights the importance of transparency, right? Like, yeah, if, I mean, think of like we were talking about earlier, we were, we were joking about the, the congressional trials of, of Mark Zuckerberg, the Zuckerberg <laughs> trials of 2000, <laughs> whatever. Um, if he had just come out and said, you know what, we don't use the microphone, but Google does. And we get the data from there. How many more questions would have been happening after that? Instead of instead of protecting what's actually happening by saying, well, we're not at fault, we're not violating our end user license agreement and whatever we're doing is fine. 
but we're not going to tell you how we're doing it. We're doing it. We're getting it. You know, we're getting it, but we're not doing any of the things you're asking us questions about. So we can confidently just say no and not d divulge. If you just came out and said, hey, this is what we're doing. And this is how we're doing it. And this is how it works. And this is how we get the data. And if you really wanted to avoid this, make sure you're turning off your microphone or disable Google search unless you actually say these keywords or change your keyword to something else other than Google or Alexa. Um, then, then how much how much fear would there be in what they're doing? Because they would tell you what they're doing exactly and how to hack it. And then you would say, wow, that's kind of a cool company. I don't mind that they do that for X, Y, Z. And there are other times that I do mind. The, mm -hmm. the problem is, is that we, you know, we don't we don't embrace transparency to the level that we should. I think in many cases, but we, um, don't. we I, absolutely don't. I'm I'm a huge proponent of it. I love transparency. I think transparency is very important. Uh, in, in the way that we communicate and in the way that we build trust and confidence in everything that we do. You know, for me, I would much rather work with a company or for a company that are black and, you know, totally black and white with me. This is the way, this is what we're doing. This is the way things work. You know, this is, this is where we are financially. This is how we're doing six, you know, where we are successfully. And it gives you a better understanding and, and even more confidence going, okay, I've got a, I, I know my place. I know what I'm doing. You know, I, I, I feel confident. It builds up that sense of confidence. Yeah, like, I, like you said, I think it gives us an idea of what our role is and where we can make the most impact in progressing, right? I mean, I think, I think that's what it does. When you, when, you, when you hide the inner workings, you know, people don't know what part of the machine they're in. And if you don't know what the part of the machine you're in and you're just meant to be a blind tool, um, you don't have the opportunity to innovate or to go outside of your purvey and use other skills that you may have to actually move something forward. And so um, that's a whole other thing as well, right? With management and transparency <laughs> and technology and all those things. But, but, I, but I, I think, you know, the more, the more we can request push for transparency with our technology providers and ask questions about how things work, um, I think the, the like you said, the more we eliminate these conspiracies, and then the more we can figure out how to use the technology without, um, while still mitigating those risks, like Christy was saying. Yeah, so. absolutely. And speaking of Christy, she did have a, a a pretty interesting question that popped up here a little earlier um, about uh, ex the experiential shift from public spaces into the virtual spaces. So how do you how do you see that transition? Uh, from people within public spaces over to a virtual environment or virtual spaces, so we're seeing that a lot right now. You know, a lot of a lot of sessions that I've had, a lot of guests I've had on the show come from working inside of extended realities and uh, or extended reality technologies and working in live events and and you know working on ways to be able to transition concerts and these events over into a, a virtual environment where people can feel more safe or experiencing them more more from home yeah so i think i think there are two two main things that we haven't um that we haven't tapped into in a way that we could to make virtual events better right so um the first one of those things is you know imagine you're at a concert you're looking at a virtual concert you're watching a virtual concert um Typically, what you're getting is you're getting a camera view with a couple different zoom levels. Maybe you can even select that, you know, I like this. I like to zoom into the stage here. Or I like to have this view from a different angle in the balcony or whatever that happens to be. That's interesting, an interesting enough, but it's a it's a fixed point of view. And yeah. we know that we know that immersion takes, you know, we know that agency increases participation, right? When I have a choice over what I see, how I'm seeing it. Um, I'm more immersed in my environment. So I choose your own adventure books were so cool when I was a kid, right? Like, you, oh, oh, wow, I can choose the, I can choose the ending. Like, wow, this is amazing. Um, so, you know, instead of, instead of doing something like we're doing now, what we're doing now is we're leveraging tools we already have, but why not put a, why not put a 360 camera in every other chair in a stadium that's not being used or in 10 of them, let's say. And now when you have virtual concert access, you can buy virtual concert access to the floor, or you can buy virtual concert access to row 15, or you can buy virtual con concert access to another chair. But when you're in that VR extended reality, you can actually, as you move your head back and forth, you're getting, you're actually able to ma maneuver through that 360 view of the camera that's there mm -hmm. individually. So it's not being controlled by somebody else turning left and right. If you wanna see the person that's standing next to you while, 
you know, you uh, one republic is singing on the stage, you turn your head to the right and you watch their reaction because they're there. Because that's what we do. You know, the, there's nothing more contagious than being in a movie theater during a funny movie, right? Like the <laughs>, laughs that happened when I saw American Pie for the first time, I'll date myself again, like in 2000 or whatever it came out in. The laughs that happened when I saw that or something about Mary or other things, they're, they last for minutes. And it's there's this ethos that happens when you're there with other people experiencing the same mm -hmm. thing chemically in a space and you're hearing it and feeling it. You look at somebody and they're laughing and they drop their popcorn and they spit soda out of their mouth and you're like, wow, and you start laughing even more. I mean, we don't have that level of access into our virtual events right now, right? So I think that's yeah. one thing. I think the other thing is, is that um, many times we're so into our 2D assets, our PowerPoint slides and all these things. If we're doing a product demo, why not, why shouldn't we be, you know, as AV people, as show people, we should be going to more shows like Seagraph and the Unreal Engine show and things like that. You know, our manufacturers, our, our providers, they create 3D assets for these things, for manufacturing products, for, for building information models for architects, they've got Revit blocks and all these things. Why aren't we taking our virtual events and putting people in an environment where they can actually manipulate a 3D asset on their own? So somebody's talking about the back of a box. I have the box there. I can spin it, look at it, go, oh, that's what they're talking about, as opposed to waiting for them to flip a slide to something. Or they mention something about how the box can be used. And I'm thinking in my head, well, technically, it would need X, Y, Z in order to facilitate that feature. So I can spin the box around and look at it without interrupting the team, without having to ask a question, without having to ask for another asset. Um, so creating opportunities to participate individually within a community space and being able to control the view, not only of the environment and the people, so control and manipulate assets during that event. And these are all things we could do. We just have to start to unlock, okay, Zoom isn't the platform to do it, right? Just Absolutely. putting everything into a Zoom call isn't gonna work, right? Not that Zoom is not a great tool for what it does, it is, but just creating, turning everything into a Zoom meeting isn't the answer to unlocking virtual, right? No, absolutely not. Uh, we're starting to see some different hints of platforms starting to become a, more available on the market. I think, yeah. you know, as I said in the past, COVID has given an, a, a lot of opportunity to be able to kind of put these technologies in hyperdrive as far as development yeah. goes. But at the same time, nobody was ready for it. You know, it just yeah. kind of happened. March happened. Everybody went, okay, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. You're locked in now. Can't go out. Can't can't do, you know, your normal daily things anymore. Um, and then everybody just went, oh, okay. Well, what do we do now? And the systems and the platforms and everything just were not there to support it. I think one of the nice things with Zoom is Zoom was already working in the educational industry, you know, to work as a, telecommunication, video communication tool within that industry. And they were at the right place at the right time. You know, definitely uh, it, it fit the need of the time and the moment that impacted us. But now we're sitting here seven months in and um, we're starting to see a lot of evolution and different platforms starting to come out of the woodworks that are allowing us to at least experiment and and uh, become more immersed in some of these environments now. So I, personally, I'm you know sitting inside of where I sit inside of the industry. I'm really interested to see what's going to evolve and what's going to come out um, during the course of the next even five six months. You know, we've come screaming along the rails in a very short period of time. So what's going to happen within the next six months is going to be really interesting because there's people up now starting to figure out what works, what doesn't work, how to be able to work with communication pipelines um, and workflows between different applications and, and between different types of technologies just, that just were not there before because there, there was no need, you know, there was no demand, so. Yeah, I agree. I think we've isolated the gaps. And I think the biggest, you know, the biggest takeaway I got from anybody who's trying to navigate um, the new, the new workplace, I know we're closing, the new workplace with uh, technology is that 
you know, aha moments are rarely scheduled. And yeah. when everything when everything is a meeting that's scheduled at 2 p.m., the the you know the opportunity, the synergy that happens when two, two people bump into each other, that energy, the collisions. You know, the the office is a large hadron collider for the most part, right? Just bouncing people around, and at some point, two people hit and something happens that wouldn't have happened uh, on a schedule. So we need to we need to figure that part out. That's kind of like even being here. You know, a little bit different, more casual, just talk away, Love it. have engagement from the viewers and questions. And it's just been a great experience. I've, I've actually really loved having something that's just super cash and being able, I just say yeah. cash, if I just used that term, but having, having the hey, I wore a t-shirt, you. you know, <laughs> I wore a t-shirt. Yeah, I, I <laughs> but Mark, I'd like to thank you so much for being on the show with me today. It's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been great having you here and having some of the insights that you bring to us. Uh, I hope as a viewer, I hope you've all really enjoyed it as well. If you'd like to reach Mark, we're kind of posting on the bottom of the screen like we usually do. You can reach him at his email address at mark at um, mark at Tangram. Is it uh, sorry, mark at, at tangraminteriors.com or his yep. personal website at Mark Coxon, www.markcoxon.com. Mark, are those the two best ways to get in touch with you? Best, best places, the other place, uh, at AV Phenom on Twitter. So if you're a tweeter on Twitter, um, <laughs> I don't want to say the past tense of tweet because I don't know what that is. And that might be a bad word. But if you were a, <laughs> if you were a tweeter on Twitter, then go to at AV Phenom. There it is right there. Look at that. That's amazing. Hey. And you can, you can find me there too. <laughs> well, Mark, thanks for being on the show. Uh, next week, I have Tim Nash coming on from Wild VC. We're going to be speaking a lot more about technology and um, use inside the retail space. Tim is a retail creative expert uh, and visual thinker and brand activator. So it's going to be really interesting conversation to kind of get a better uh, insight as to how technology is being used inside the retail spaces as well which is something that I've always been really interested in um, to see how things are evolving and things are changing. And as I say every single week, folks, stay with us and be well and stay ahead of the curve. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, all. Appreciate it.